songs about stuff, any <laughs> things you notice or think about what kind of, are there surprises, are there things that are a little bit what you might not have expected uh, in the lyrics, What if you had to interpret these as texts, if you found them in an interview, what are they telling you about the period, any? Um, something I was not expecting was the uh, political meanings, the sort of songs were very political, making Specific, they had specific messages. Mm -hmm. I was expecting songs about people's experiences. Uh -huh. So if I found it in an interview, I would say that this helps me understand what people's political meanings were at the time, whether there was a consensus or um, you know, or support of certain political parties. So mm -hmm. That's really cool. I would add to that too by saying that it also shows you how involved, <coughs> on a personal mm -hmm. level, people felt with the politics at the yeah. time. Um, they were involved and they were knowledgeable, so they could they could make up these lyrics and, and have it resonate with other people. Other things, yeah. I was surprised by the line in the chorus of Fall of Twenty Nine, but it made it fall more human since the Fall of Twenty Nine. That's a good. That's a good line. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about that? Well, it's this is this is all, you could play a lot with this song in it time of 1% to 99% to 47% and so on. And clearly there's something about the leveling effect of hard times that people noticed and that whole song is all about, it made us all more, not only more human, but more equal because we're all in the same boat. And that's what each of those verses is about somebody who once was privileged. One wants to imagine, you know, Ann Romney going door to door selling magazines. Uh, you know, it might happen. <laughs> I was thinking about the, the issue of, of fact versus versus the, the narration and that um, it doesn't really matter when you hear the song whether it's fact or not. And what you said about Pete Seeger, suddenly a memory came back to me of being in the backseat of the car with my sister. We used to sing when we were on a trip and we would fight like crazy about the words and we always resolved it by saying, well, it's a folk song. <laughs> I was going to say that these songs are about economic devastation, but the songs themselves uh, restore the dignity of the of the singer, and and they're quite cheerful um, musically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's um, a great observation. That struck us too. It's yeah, part of the reason we were so drawn to the music because it's really about a, a devastating period of time, and yet as soon as you sing about it, yeah, it must have. I wonder if it must have made a difference to them too to be able to find this kind of an outlet and share it. And you tell people, as, as I often do, that are doing music from the Great Depression, and you know, they want to give you some Lexapro or something. Because they just want to see slash your wrist, but the music is not like that. Even the, the blues tunes from the East Coast um, were not these desperate songs. I mean, it's, it, part of it is uh, they said were so bad that they had to find a lighter side to it. And the other is, in my opinion, the resiliency uh, of Americans at that time. You know, we were still dealing, dealing with a lot of first generation who still thought they were in the promised land, but this was kind of a speed bump. Again, a lot of that one that came before, the, the, panic, um, the uh, panic is on, which is about a lot of hard things, but there's a lot of energy yeah. in that, and there's the humor, and there's the way it ends up uh, we've always been struck with how many of these songs deal with prohibition. We think about FDR and the New Deal, but they're coming out of the 20s. Mm -hmm. And so one of the dominant realities, one of the things that's really powerful about Roosevelt is that he got rid of prohibition. And that mattered. And so that whole Panic is On song, you're not really, I was not prepared. It was one, you know, litany after another of people, you know, sort of scrabbling by. And that whole last verse is about, you know, 
until we have you know, cheap wine, you know, light wine, beer, and gin, um, the panic is still on. So, it's, uh, so uh, yeah. Well, one thing that kind of surprised me about the lyrics of um, Happy Daniel in the fall of 29 was that the uh, taxi driving ex stockbroker is kind of presented in a pretty sympathetic way. And then that seems to stand in kind of stark contrast with the, the attitude that would make pretty Floyd Floyd such an appealing character and that kind of problem. That, and then I realized that it was written by a sales manager, and I was wondering if that represented <laughs> uh, an attitude or if he injected that as some sort of. Well, there's also a sense that being a stockbroker is not, you're not an essentialized eternal member of an elite, that you could be brought down like anybody else and then you're sitting there driving a taxi cab, and therefore we can we can deal with it. And I think, you know, in those days, we didn't have stockbrokers making you know, six, seven hundred million a year. Um, they were making, you know, upper middle class money, but it was, it was very different. And very few people on the stock, but everybody used a bank in one form or another, so that the hatred for the banks was pretty deep. In a one percent world, it's really hard to imagine those people from Lehman Brothers as Iceman or driving or selling out of windows. Or selling out. Well, there was, there was a line that, that struck me um, very curious in um, uh, uh, Breadline Blues, where the, I think it's the second verse where they say uh, it's a rich man's job to make the rules in order to rid our Breadline Blues. It's a very interesting observation that at that time <coughs> it was almost it was accepted that, that the rich are in power and it is their job to solve this problem. And the writer of the song seems very content with that idea. It's just that they're not doing it. And because they're not doing it, they're going to remove the, uh, the donkey and the public party from office. What struck me about the, the narratives uh, is that they're speaking in the collective. I mean, they're speaking for us, they're speaking for we, and they're dealing with grand themes about the nation. And, you know, in oral history stories, so many of them are individual or more localized or something like that. So that confidence. They're, they're singing and they're speaking on behalf of the whole community. Mm -hmm. It's really moving. Yeah, you can notice that in a lot of the songs, even in the fall of 29, where they have that line about it makes us all more human. Mm -hmm. That's a really different sentiment than you find now with people facing hard times. They don't say, well, we can be more human. They're, there's a lot more blaming going on and a lot more polarization and division. Yeah, a guy named Robert Dinger, who used to be a writer for the nation, wrote a book on the 1930s, looking back five decades and or four decades and saying those were the good old bad times. Ah, really? Yeah. I want to underscore the point that Tom made is, and you'll see this in some of the other ones coming up, is that the, the position in these songs is sometimes really subtle and not something that falls into any, that thing about it's the rich man's job to make some rules. And I, elites are fine if they actually did it and we're looking out for the rest of us like, you know, if we're going to have noblesse oblige, let's have the oblige, please, you know. So that doesn't fit the easy categories of 1% or 99%. And I think you'll find in some of the others we do a really surprising complexity, and it sort of forces you to think about things more than, rather than just find something that you can attach to a particular, you know, pre-existing position. So we're going to do a couple now um, that move it along and focus a little bit on Roosevelt and the power that he had and it's another level of the folk music. It's not just about politics, but about a particular, you know, emotional connection to um, to FDR and the New Deal. And there'll be some things here. I think the uh, the first one we'll do without the slides, and then Sylvester will do the slides. This song is uh, written by a guy named Bill Cox, who is uh, in Charleston, West Virginia, and he. Uh, he tells the story of his respect for Roosevelt uh, from a different, very different point of view. Uh, a speaker in the song is a donkey, and it is a democratic donkey, and that's the name of the song. Yeah. 
the roads about the rocky end of town. He mounted to the saddle and he grabbed the bridle rein. I'm back in old Columbia, the same old story. Hallelujah. So the story goes that um, Harris calls the White House and he gets somebody. He says, I don't want to talk to him. I talk to the president. And they say, well, you can't talk to the president. So he hangs up. He calls back the next night. And uh, Roosevelt had been uh, brought into this uh, library. And he was waiting for Missy Lehan, who was his assistant, to come in. And she was going to answer the phone. And he was just going to sit there. And she was late. So the phone rang. And he picked it up. And it was Sylvester. And Sylvester said, uh, I want to talk to Roosevelt. He said, this is the president. So he tells him his story. He's going to lose his farm. And Roosevelt says, Sylvester, don't worry. You will hear from me. And the story is he contacted the refinance administration, who contacted the bank, and they saved Sylvester's farm. <laughs> and uh, the next Thanksgiving, and every Thanksgiving until Roosevelt died, um, at Warm Springs, Georgia, where Roosevelt spent his uh, Thanksgiving, a giant turkey. One of Roosevelt's maids said that the first time, the first turkey that arrived, she brought it in to the president and said, I handed him a card, it was just signed Sylvester. And she was about to explain to him who Sylvester was, figuring he wouldn't remember. He looked at the card and he said, Sylvester Harris, 
I wonder how this from the singer. So, so, uh, so this song was performed by Memphis Minnie, a wonderful, great, great blues singers of all time. Um, we don't think she wrote it. We don't know who wrote it. it, it in all likelihood, the uh, best guess is a guy named Casey Bill Weldon, who she was living with at the time, who was a guitar player, and wrote some WPA songs. Uh, and Tension recorded it. She was living with him. So uh, it's called Sylvester and His Wife. And he decided he would send the president some news. Sylvester went out across his field, looking to pray and moan. He cried, oh no, I'm about to lose my home. Sylvester went out across his field, looking to pray and moan. Right, oh Lord, I'm about to lose my home. He thought about the president, he got on the wire. If I lose my home, I believe I'll die. He thought about the president, and he got on the wire. If I lose my home, I believe I'll die. Tell them what that feels like. Thank you. 
And there's nothing that ever said that she did. I, I will always assume that she came upon it that way, and her mind just said, oh. Uh, but I don't know that. Uh, this is a question about the, the second one, the death of the blue eagle. And it, judging from the lyrics, it seems kind of like a response to an early setback of New Deal legislation. And I was wondering if there was any optimism about the legislation that replaced the NRA. Was, it, was that the NRIA? And, or was that totally unrelated? I thought that was also about labor relations? And well, that, it, it, with the, the uh, uh, Wagner Act, National Labor Relations Act, was passed within six months of the, of the uh, repeal. And that was sponsored by Wagner from New York. And, and that really embraced all the labor aspects of, um, of collective bargaining and child labor. Uh, so, and that was probably, you know, there was, uh, this had worked its way through the courts. And, I think everyone in the Roosevelt administration, except Franklin Roosevelt, saw that there was a good chance it was going to be repealed. He seemed pretty shocked. So, so that was the, the Wagner Act was, was the reaction. The, the, the attempt to really manipulate the economy and pricing and wages, I don't think there was another specific uh, piece of new legislation that tried to do that. But the interesting thing about the song, I mean, you know, we obviously deal today with the question of what do you do if there's a Supreme Court that takes on the role of blocking um, a lot of initiatives. And that was certainly their situation. And Roosevelt made the choice, as many of you know, to try to reconstruct the Supreme Court, which was a disastrous miscalculation. It was seen as, to me, that was the court packing plan to try to sort of get more people that he could appoint to the court because he wasn't getting the appointments. And what the song talks about is the popular response, which was, the NRA had been all about large-scale industry and labor rights, and the major organizing drives of the CIO were the response of the labor movement to this, basically taking it out and saying it's up to us in the streets and in organizing to do what the government, there's only so much the government can do, and now the Supreme Court is blocking them, and that's not likely to change quickly enough. And so in that song itself, it's, it's sort of a surprising part of the lyric that basically shows the shift. Now we have the UMWA, the Mine Workers Union, which is one of the major focuses of the NRA, and think how much you got in 1932 and how much, you know, we have, a, what's the line? We have an order. An order now, the UMWA. Uh, and so that really traces that shift. And again, this to me is an example of where, in this case, the folk music is making a very profound political point that most of the textbooks, which talk only about the court packing plan, uh, as if the Supreme Court politics are limited to the Washington Beltway and Roosevelt's response. And then they deal with the CIO drives later. And the song is showing a direct connection of one as a response to the other, which is a pretty profound historical insight, actually. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. Question? Yeah. Probably the, the uh, in retrospect among the conservatives and liberals, the most popular uh, piece of New Deal legislation created the Civilian Conservation Corps, which most people think was a pretty good thing. Um, in a very short period of time, Roosevelt put several hundred thousand young men to work, and the CCC was formed uh, to do conservation work primarily, but also uh, to put money into the economy and to uh, uh, serve as, as a job training program for young men. And they, between the ages of 17 and 24, you could join the uh, NRA for six month terms. CCC, and uh, you were paid thirty dollars a month. Twenty-five went home to your family, and five you got to keep. And they lived in military-style barracks um, that was set up by retired military people, and um, so it was like entering the army, but you did conservation work and different types of work. And um, you remember, in 1933, uh, many, uh, very few people traveled, and so for most of these young men, they'd never been away from home. Before. So they sense the idea that, that these kids are not going to be happy. It's going to be hard work, and they're going to get homesick. So they transferred. So if you, if you lived in New York City and you joined the NRA, chances are you'd end up a CCC boy. Uh, you'd end up in Carlsbad, New Mexico, or something. So it was too far to leave camp and come home. So there were a lot of homesick people. So this song 
is uh, unlike some of the other songs that um, uh, glorify the Indian legislation. This is a very lonesome young man wrote this song. Um, uh, Dickey is in a camp in Texas. And we don't know who wrote it, but uh, we've heard someone sing it who said he learned it from his boyfriend in a camp in Texas, but doesn't name it. CCC troops. Yeah. So we um, something to just keep in the back of your mind because we'll talk about these two as a bracket. If the NRA songs are really like folk music pushing a good history text into complex areas, these two are both surprising. They're not what you think the history text will be focused on at all. And we might talk about what you find surprising. When our old age pension check comes to our door, we won't have to dread the poor house anymore. Though no, we're old and dense and gray, the times will be back to stay. When our old age pension check comes to our door. When her old age pension check comes to her door, some sort of retirement plan. In fact, that guy, Leo Daniel, Patty O'Daniel, that was how he was elected uh, governor of Texas. He, of course, he didn't do it, but he, he promised everybody this, this retirement plan. And uh, Roosevelt really wasn't ready for it. He kept kind of trying to delay it. it and uh, Townsend became so popular, and Townsend's plan was, was uh, based on a sales tax. And it was 
totally unfeasible. There was, there was not a possible way that it would raise enough money to cover retirement. But it became popular in these Townsend clubs that Peggy alluded to. They, there were like 5,000 of them, and um, you paid a dime every month, and the dime went to Washington for lobbying. And so there's the, the line in the song, uh, Send Your Dimes to Washington. The gimmick of the plan, which is a really interesting kind of economic insight, was that people, old age people, would get these pensions with one condition, that they yeah. had to spend it within 30 days. 30 days. Okay. So the idea was that this money would then be recycled through the economy. If it just went into the mattress, it wasn't really helping um, prime the pump of recovery. So they were thinking hard about how do you get an economy that's on stall into motion? So it was a kind of incentive or stimulus plan to link, in this sense, the funding of what would become Social Security to get that money into circulation to restore. And, and it, it really forced the Social Security legislation because it was becoming so popular, this whole notion. And it, it, you know, the sales tax thing didn't work. There was no way, there wasn't an economist in this country that's, that could vouch for the numbers. So it uh, really forced Roosevelt and you know, Congress to pass uh, Social Security legislation. But aside, and I think in the, there was pictures in there. You might have seen a white-haired man. Was, was, but aside from all the politics, what else do you read in that song as a way in which this folk music is sort of changing your expectations? It's not a, quite a debate about Social Security. So, so both of those, the, the CCC blues, as Tom said, all about this is, you know, not rah-rah for a government program, even though it was, they still have reunions of people in the camps, but the experience was very different, and that's what the folk music in this case is about, and it's one of the powerful records we have. In fact, we found a few other CCC songs, and most of them are pretty cynical and bitter yeah. uh, um, about, about, the, about the camps. Yet in the photographs, for the most part, they look like they're having a baby. They look like they're at camp. Yeah, they do. <laughs> camp camp. They do. Yeah. So Smile it could the have. <laughs> well, it could have been that, or it could have been the way kids at camp do that too. You know, say, oh, I hate this place. I can't wait to go home. Mm -hmm. You know, and then when they go home, they're home sick for camp. The last two sets are essentially about the Dust Bowl and about migration and migratory workers and a lot of the stuff that feeds into that <coughs> part of the, particularly the FSA work in the migrant camps. So the first uh, group is three songs, uh, essentially about migration and uh, homesickness and moving west. <laughs>
actually a swing song, and we have, for you tonight, a film clip from the movie of them singing this song, so you can see where this, this the person we heard, who we learned it off of, must have seen this in the movies, or heard a recording of it, and, and which was a very pop song, and then turned it into what we thought was this very sad, slow voice song. So, you're going to like this. <laughs> Oh, my God. 
the pea coat. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a sense, you know, I mean, on a serious level, that in a lot of treatments of folk music, the folk art imagined is in this sort of timeless, essential folk world, you know, not really conscious actors in their real society. And as you heard in a lot of these songs, they're really quite engaged. And so there's no reason why people, I mean, I've heard interviews with old fiddlers, where did you learn that song? Thinking it was going to be from somebody's great grandfather. They said, well, off of the radio, coming from Chicago. So they are really in their world and processing things, and in this case, taking a popular movie and turning it into a very different song when Tom found it in the archive. So we've been talking about folk music as oral history, but some of this is folk music in oral history and sort of talking to each other. So um, we have just a couple of things that are drawn from a lot of the interviews that are in the same Library of Congress uh, recordings that, uh, where Tom found a lot of the songs. And so you get things like this, and I want you to, we thought it would be helpful to really hear some of these voices, and you can think about the connections to the songs that you've heard. So I'll just play a couple of things. This is the indexing program that we use in a lot of the work that we've done with oral histories that uh, proves to be very helpful for this. Well, the reason I left them for one, I couldn't find enough words to do to uh, support my family, me and my wife and six kids. And there wasn't enough to do that with the timber work. And when you cut a rick wood and call it in town and sold it, you know, the dog dog required his lucky, he sold it. For the rick. And I used to sit in that hotel many a day and look across the street where people was lined up down the streets with buckets in their hands going to get a bucket of soup. Rila and Anna Arkin thought it was a Day, trying to make a few pennies to drive that old hunger away. Oklahoma, farewell. 
example of what some of the field recordings sound like that are very continuous with the oral histories and some of the other songs. Sunny California. This is one I wrote myself about coming our trip to California. I left Texas one beautiful day. I made up my mind that I would not stay. No longer in Texas the place that I loved. So it was like giving surprising connections between the oral histories and the folk music. So this is sort of about how can you take the folk music seriously. So I want you to listen to a couple of things that we were alert to because we knew the words of some of the songs, and then I'll play you the song. So these are some unusual turns of phrase, and a lot of you work in oral history often pay attention to how people say things. So, um, we started them for our children. And uh, in Arizona, we landed in the Salmon, Arizona, and picked cotton for the good year out there. Okay, that word landed. Find a number of these songs, they talk about, I landed in California, I landed. Well, they're not flying. Um, so you might think about that, we can talk about it, why, where that term comes from and what, what it evokes, and as, a, as opposed to saying we arrived in California, but we landed in California or Arizona. Um, uh, and another term, oh, here's another one. About the grapes of wrath. But I find that if we live right, some way, somehow, we'll find a happy landing sooner or later. So that's, um, again, landing. And another phrase we heard is uh, this one. Then we come on over and California in 38, and at uh, that time, came quite a flood in California. There are some others. It came quite a flood. It came a flood. And here is a quote from a song we'll do called Sunny Cal by a man named Jack Bryant. And you'll listen, you'll hear both of those phrases that we pointed out. Night that left here, it almost came a flood. So we just started working up these, but I think you're going to find, we're going to find lots of places where as we get deeper into these interview narratives, there's lots of evidence of a kind of continuity of sensibility between the way people talk and the way the songs are, are written and what's, as they say in cultural studies, what's inscribed in these songs through the language choices that people are making. So, yeah. 